Okay, thank you all. It's great being here. Um, so, uh, as a completely unnecessary preface, let me say that I put together this talk description about 11 months ago in the sort of rushed moments before the Linux Conf AU deadline because I thought that it might be up their alley, and it was. Uh, I kind of like assembled things that I knew with keywords that sounded cool into a talk proposal, and you know, it worked. Uh, and as I was preparing for it six months ago, I realized that the content is actually pretty cool. It's not just keyword spam. So uh, I hope you all take it with, a, with an open mind, even if it sounds kind of intense. So uh, this talk is called Quantitative Community Management. And uh, in the talk, we're going to talk a bit about, I'm going to talk a bit about, and hopefully maybe you guys will too if there's time afterwards, about surveys that people do in open source projects to get a sense of what their communities are like. Uh, different active interventions people have staged to improve the diversity and outreach education qualities of their communities, and how to do all those things very effectively from what we know, and what studies seem to still be required, and what work is going on now. So briefly, uh, my introduction to free software was that in, at a summer camp, I was lucky enough to have a friend who told me something about Linux, and I was even lucky enough to have a computer at home. So when I got back from camp, I went to my bedroom and searched on Hotbot for Linux, and I found all this stuff going on. I installed a web browser, and the default, uh, the default bookmarks for Netscape for on Linux back then seemed to always include slash dot. So I was reading that, and people were talking about how there's this new issue where some Norwegian teenager wrote a DVD decryption program called DCSS that removes the content scrambling system from DVDs. And if you want to write your own DVD player, you have to remove this, even if it's just to play the DVD. This by itself is not that exciting. People need to write software. But the exciting part was that in the US, the software was illegal because to play DVDs, you need to remove copy protection. And since two years ago, that was not allowed. And it became very clear to me that there was this uh, growing rift between what's permissible to do in law and what people want to do. And free software seemed to be pushing the boundaries of that quicker than anything else. Uh, so I learned more about the GNU Manifesto because I do my high school C++ homework and I typed control H M in Emacs. And then it told me all about it and I became a convert. And I started reading the writings of Seth David Schoen, who's a San Francisco-based Electronic Frontier staff technologist. And in 2006, I was pretty basically confused that when I invited him to lunch because I was living in San Francisco for a summer, he like said okay and hung out with me. Uh, and then Bio7, I was hanging out with him so much that I concluded that if this luminary is someone who I can go and get to know, then there are not enough people active in free software activism. <laughs> and so in 2009, I founded this organization called Open Hatch, which I work for as the nonprofit now. So uh, in finding out what our community is like, this is, I guess, one approach to measuring that. There are other approaches, and the most well-known approach stems from 2001. It's called the Floss Survey. Uh, it's by Ghosh et al. from III Maastricht. And it has all these lovely, uh, these lovely figures and charts. So this survey was an opt-in survey sent to users of SourceForge.net. How many of you have SourceForge accounts? OK, cool. Uh, almost half or something. And wait, can I have to see those hands again? OK. Uh, it, um, the, the survey was pretty long because these researchers wanted to know what drives people to create free software. How much time do they spend on it? Who are they? What are their professional backgrounds? What are their education, cultural, personal statistics? And we learned a few things from that survey. We learned that the motivations to develop free software, uh, primarily it's to learn and develop new skills according to the highest ranked option there. Um, sharing your knowledge, participating in a new kind of cooperation. Well, uh, the term open source was only two years old, three years old at the time. And uh, somehow to participate in the scene, rank reasonably highly too. Maybe that's why I do it, actually. But um, from that study, we also learned some demographic data. We learned supposedly that 1.1% of the people in the free software community that they surveyed are women. And when they reran the study, when other people reran the study with the US focus, they got this plus or minus 50% number, uh, which you know, is still pretty tiny. But I want to think a bit about the methodology again. So the authors of that study emphasize in their paper that rather than seeking out 
a narrow band of very well-controlled people. They wanted respondents to come from all sorts of open source life. They wanted respondents to figure out for themselves if they should be considered developers. And uh, if you know something about things like selection bias or our stereotype threat, you might realize that if their goal is to analyze <laughs> the entire community, it's not going to work this way. So these sorts of opt-in surveys have these massive bias problems, but the most exciting thing about them, I think, is that we just don't know how biased they are. Maybe uh, when the US survey went out, it was a three-day weekend, and that meant that people in Michigan who mostly do their open source as part of academia uh, could take a break from their research and answer this great email survey. I don't know, nor do the authors of the study. Uh, but there's a bunch of sort of general work on more about what the community looks like. People want to find out what open source projects look like characteristically. And one pretty good sample survey for that is the Who Writes Linux report run by the Linux Foundation. So uh, they run this, I think, every year. These numbers are from the Linux kernel 2.6.30. These numbers are especially interesting in that they are calculated based on the Git repository plus follow-on analysis. So in a way, there's no sample bias because they manage to cover all the Git commits. But on the other hand, if there's valuable Linux contributions people are making, for example, maintaining the kernel newbies.org wiki or doing patch review on the kernel list, you're not going to see those in these figures. But at least they're precise. They're asking who writes Linux. So a bunch of people. Pretty cool. Turns out free software is a pretty uh, broad, uh, highly collaborative enterprise. But uh, not always. So if you, well, uh, I, so I have a question. And for those of you who know this figure, maybe don't answer. And the question is, what is the median number of contributors to an open source project? Uh, do any of you two want to guess? The median, right? So it's got to be greater than or equal to one and less than or equal to probably 1,150 since that's a highly, highly collaborative project. Four, I see. Any other numbers? Two. I'm open to more guesses. Any other numbers? I know it's for real, so I'm not going to guess. All right, and I, I see some other, some other grinning hands in the back. So let's look at a graph. Uh, if you look at all products on sourceforge.net, the, uh, let's say, vast majority have one developer. Uh, I think you have to hit, well, you have to hit some pretty high percentiles to go even to two. But you know, this is silly, right? On SourceForge, I made this great project that I almost did no work on. That doesn't really matter. What matters on, is open source that people will use, software that is categorized as mature and production ready. And you see the same graph, uh, at least on SourceForge. And if you look for projects that are at least downloaded in the very high percentiles, not just where they're supposedly ready for people to use, but where they're actually used by people, then you see basically the same graph. Uh, the median is still one over here. This entire figure is greater than the sum of that tail. Similarly, in other collaborative enterprises, uh, there's this, there's this uh, children-oriented programming language called Scratch, where all projects in Scratch are made inside an interface that ensures collaboration is possible. Because the, you, every project has an edit link. Every project can be forked and worked on independently. There's no requirement to sh share things upstream if you want to be counted as someone who's made a derivative work. So you, know, you might say that perhaps the problem with SourceForge is that it's too hard to get involved with too many uh, submitting patches by email or into the bug track or the patch tracking system. But if you look on Scratch for projects uh, that are at least one year old, you see the same graph. Uh, but you know, for Google Code uh, or other, other enterprises where they're newer than SourceForge, maybe GitHub, people are probably more collaborative on those. So uh, this is what Google Code looks like in terms of median numbers of contributors. And there's a bunch of these, right? These are just the active projects. These are the projects on GitHub that are public. And my favorite thing about this graph is that here developers is so liberally defined as to mean even somebody who's watching the repository, who started. Uh, this looks at least as bad as that original SourceForge graph. So I don't know, maybe open source isn't a very collaborative enterprise after all. I want to go back to the Ghosh survey and ask some questions. Uh, maybe the reason we see so few women in the Ghosh survey is that perhaps 
pure women start projects and on SourceForge is overrepresented by projects on that one contributor scale. So maybe emailing all the SourceForge contributors is a bad way to reach people who participate in multiple projects. Um, it could also be that men and free software in 2001 were somehow using different or self-hosting. So maybe gdun.org would have been a better place to find the women in, in free software. Uh, or maybe, and I think this is the most interesting, maybe women were just less likely to answer the question. They were more busy. They saw a question about gender and just like quit. I don't know. Uh, and I think that the fact that we don't know these questions comes down to the notion that most of these surveys are sort of looking for academic factoids. They're not trying to give us all information to help make our communities better. They're trying to understand free software because they're so impressed by this novel economic system. And we're like just busy making it. And fundamentally, they're being measured by people who don't have an interest in the results, an interest in the sense of skin in the game. They're curious. So uh, at this point, you might conclude that all our opt-in surveys, if you're Mako Hill especially, are just hopelessly broken. <laughs> and uh, with this one caveat that you have to know who answered. So the, the who wrote the kernel questions, you at least know who's in the Git repository. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, we learned something that's of some significance from this ghost survey, right? We learned that probably about one-ish, maybe as many as 1.6-ish, maybe if it's twice that, 2% of the contributors to open source in 2001 were women. And we can all be perfectly rationally distressed by that number, even if we don't know exactly where the bias lies. So you might say that getting data from those surveys is good enough. And that's sort of what I thought until I started prepping this talk. And as I worked through what I was going to say, I realized that, first of all, we don't know the boundaries of that. Maybe SourceForge had, maybe we really should have been looking at the Live Journal community or something, not in 2001. But I don't know. More interesting, though, is the question of how we measure progress. So if in 2001 we have these two numbers, 1.1% or 1.6%, uh, in 2013, do we know if we're getting better? Um, if we're trying particular outreach efforts, uh, maybe those outreach efforts just aren't working. Or maybe they're working like crazy, and we need to pour money into those outreach efforts until this problem vanishes. Uh, we're not going to know if our surveys are incomprehensibly biased. And I'll demonstrate that a little more clearly in a few moments. So I wanted to, upon reading these surveys, think about how to make surveys and other quantitative measures of communities actionable for the people who are in those communities, for the people who want those projects to flourish. So in 2008, uh, Wikipedia and these same people, the UNU, Merit, uh, Gosh, et al. people, put together a survey of Wikipedia contributors. And it was another opt-in survey. It had all the methodological problems of the 2001 survey. Uh, it was at the top of every page if you were logged in, I guess, on Wikipedia. I know that I didn't see it. It's been five years, so it's probably unfair to ask you guys if you saw it. But um, they wanted to answer questions basically relating to the relationship between Wikipedia and the foundation, plus find out who these editors of Wikipedia are. And maybe we can get some bounds, at least, on things like gender diversity. So we learned that, according to the survey, 25% of these editors were younger than 18. Uh, presumably, well, we learned that most of them are younger than 22. More interesting is that, according to the survey, almost 70% of the readers alone to Wikipedia are men. And according to the survey, men are also dramatically overrepresented in the editorship. But also, more than a quarter of the people who read or edit Wikipedia speak Russian as their primary language. More than English, which strikes me as a surprise. So, uh, in fact, it strikes me as completely implausible, to be honest. Uh, maybe some Russian forum posted a link to the survey and they dominated the results because they were so excited to self-count. Or maybe some Russian native speaker sent a message to all of his Wikipedia-using friends encouraging them to follow the survey so they could be counted with this result. Or maybe that's the truth. Hard to say from this opt-in survey. And if we don't know about that, how can we know anything about these figures here? I mean, maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. They did a follow-up survey in 2011 with similar problems. Um, 
it was conducted again and presented to logged in users, and you had to opt into it. Uh, and according to that, 8.5% of Wikipedia editors are female. And if you narrow that to, you can narrow that to the US and still get pretty low figures. So we could believe from this that it's all just getting worse. Uh, perhaps it's even hopeless. Perhaps as more people sign online from 2008 to 2011, the amount of sexism globally is just increasing. And so you see this dramatic drop from, from before to down to 8.5%. Uh, or maybe the, sample, the surveys just had different bias. So remember that uh, in the UNU study, 26% of readers of Wikipedia speak Russian as their native language. Can you guys think of any way to measure, to get a sense of the native language of Wikipedia speakers if you're not doing an opt-in survey to Wikipedia? Um, what did you say? Uh, browser stats from like Google Analytics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, you can compare them against Comscore, and you'll find that 2.5% of the readers of Wikipedia seem to probably speak Russian as their primary language. Uh, what this means about that survey is that it's hard to know anything from it. Uh, so knowing just this, you can't fix up the results that we got. Um, but if you learn a little more, you can. So uh, in 2010, totally independently, the Pew Center for New Media did a phone survey of all Americans, sampled randomly, and they published all their data. The goal is to understand how internet use is present in the US, and they called Americans on the phone. Uh, uh, and cell phone, actually. Yeah. Um, they took care of that particular aspect. Um, I think it was primarily cell phone, actually. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to show you some quick results from that. Just keep in mind the figures might not add up to 100% because uh, of something I'll explain maybe when the figures are on the screen. So uh, of people in the 18 to 29% age bracket, 62% of the people in that bracket read Wikipedia. And the numbers get slightly lower, but pretty high as you increase the age brackets, uh, age bounds. In terms of gender, um, we saw from the opt-in survey that 70%, I think, of readers of Wikipedia are male. Uh, anyone want to take a guess here how it looks from Pew's perspective? Pretty close. I mean, it's like, basically, you could average those and get 53-ish percent women. It's pretty... Oh, so this is the percent of women who read Wikipedia, not the percent of readers who are women? It's the percentage of Americans who answered male in this randomly sampled survey who then said they read Wikipedia. Okay. That's what I meant by the numbers being confusing. This is how they report them, though. Um, so yeah, it's actually pretty even. Um, if you can, so just to put those in perspective, uh, sorry, to put those into perspective, there's a bunch of other discrepancies in the demographic data, too. Uh, the Pew survey showed a fairly small shift as you have people get older in terms of if they're likely to read Wikipedia, the UNU study showed a huge drop-off. So what you can do is to exercise some data recovery with some statistics. So you can build a logistic propensity score, for which I can't do it myself, but I can read the paper and get make a source code in R. Uh, but basically, you model the non-random selection. You, you make a statistical model that says that if, you were, if you're an American, the chance, is, the chance is even that you would be opted into the Pew survey. Uh, what is the chance, based on this demographic data, that you opted yourself into the, the UNU survey? And you can use that to de-skew these numbers. So you see things looking a little better. Uh, more Americans than we thought, according to these figures, are, who are women, are editing Wikipedia. And these are percentages of, these are percentages of the editor base. Um, these are much more like uh, I think the foundation set a goal of 25% or maybe 30% um, in 2011. And so Mako found, Mako found himself bemused to say that just by fixing up the data, they have gotten a large fraction of the way there. Uh, which is another way of saying that they were unable to make a reasonable plan without knowing the real facts underlying their community. So. Another interesting, another interesting angle about Wikipedia is that in, another opt -in, in that opt-in opt survey in 2011, 
uh, 70% of Wikipedia editors say that when people give them a barn star, which is an image that gets posted onto your user talk page, um, it makes them more likely to make an edit. But uh, Mako and Aaron Shaw did some, different, dis did some distinct research not on what people say, but what they do. And uh, if you measure the edit rate in the five weeks after people receive a barn star, you find that there's two categories of people, but net, people decrease their editing, editing activity by about 1.72 edits per week. Uh, but there's this very clear distinction you can draw, which is that, so bar stars get put on your user talk page, and uh, people who are totally aware of how Wikipedia user-to-user -user chat works will know and will read the text that says, just cut and paste this blob of wiki text from the user talk page into your user page to like, be so proud about your new barn star, or at least remove it from your user talk page. The people who moved or, or removed the barn star show themselves as doing three more edits per week for the next five weeks, and those that didn't remove it do less. So <laughs> exactly where the causality lies isn't clear, but you can't rationally say despite the 70% number we saw before, that handing out more barn stars as tokens of appreciation on Wikipedia is going to you know, save the, the graph that we, some of us saw talk about earlier today. And uh, that's important knowledge if what you're trying to do is get more people to edit Wikipedia or get them to make more edits to Wikipedia. There's another subtlety in the paper, uh, which you can find by searching for this, except I said the same word twice. Uh, there's a subtlety where if you, uh, whatever, I've lost it, it's fine. <laughs> you should all read the paper. Uh, oh, right, the subtlety is that it depends, it, the, there's a big question, a bigger effect than this, on whether getting a barn star increases or decreases your editing activity, and that effect is who gave you the barn star. And, <laughs> Uh, however, there was a follow-up study done by totally other people who just sort of sprayed barn stars on people's user pages randomly. Uh, <laughs> they wrote a bot. They wrote a bot to just like thank people for no reason. And um, this reminds me, I guess, of an adage that's somewhat offensive, so I'll share it in person. But basically, they made it so that if you received this object of appreciation, you would know uh, that you're being appreciated. You would know what great thing you did, even if the robot didn't. And uh, in that study, they found a slight total increase in editing from the people who received the bar stars. Although Mako thinks that they should have gotten human, right, uh, human subjects review board uh, for that by experimenting on not only all the, these editors of Wikipedia, but moreover editing on us, the readers of Wikipedia, because they're possibly ruining the encyclopedia for all of us. Um, and they didn't, but whatever. Uh, anyway, inspired by a bunch of these a bunch of these demographic studies, and especially inspired by some of the distressing early work with the opt-in surveys on the, low, on the low gender diversity breakdown in Wikipedia, the community managers at WikiHow decided to run their own survey. So their survey methodology looked a bit different. For one thing, they, they watched WikiHow for three weeks, and they just looked at who were the active editors. So they didn't have as much of uh, opt-in sample bias, I think, but moreover, they were able to quantify that bias. Uh, the Christy, Crystal, Crystal, uh, sent them a talk page message, which is the standard user-to-user -user chat system inside the wiki software. And she knows how many people were supposed to respond, which at least means that which, you know, things, can't, can, things can't possibly be twice as bad as they look in her study. And uh, yeah, these were sent by the WikiHow community manager, which, probably, which a lot of people on WikiHow interact with, so hopefully they're inclined to answer her. And according to her results, 56% are female. Um, the majority of WikiHow editors, according to this survey, are like teenagers younger than 16, which was intriguing uh, and not something that she was considering at all. Um, now, on the other hand, oh yeah, the, and the older the contributors, the more likely they are to be male. Um, I want to to narrow a bit on this notion here, the older contributors tended to be male on WikiHow, with this graph embedded. Dude, I have a mouse. This is great. So uh, she actually broke down people in, based on how active editors they are. And 
the, in this, in, if you imagine this pipeline um, where there's more new editors for women than who are men, uh, these are sorted by something crazy, ignore the sort. Uh, so if they get to the point of doing 25 plus edits, there's a huge drop off, right, from this male heavy perspective, from this female heavy perspective. Why so few do they make it through here? Um, now, admittedly, there's, she's still missing about half the users, but this is a pretty helpful graph because it suggests that there might be something that matters to some class of users about the edit interface that doesn't matter to other classes of users. And um, then as you get more and more, uh, I, get, I mean, I, I think that basically these ratios are the same. So I think almost all the drop off occurs in this range here. I don't know why. But on the other hand, maybe it, all, maybe it just means that the like 12 year olds who sign up, who are mostly women, mostly don't edit much. The one, there, Mako had some suggestions for how to improve this survey. Uh, for one thing, WikiHow, uh, so one thing we don't know is, we know that, we do know that about 52% of editors opted into the study, but we can't currently characterize the bias of the 50% or so that we're missing. One thing you can do is to ask readers of the site to fill out the same study. And maybe randomly ask readers, don't necessarily ask all of them. But this way you can get a sense of, of humans in the planet, how likely are they to answer surveys, and uh, how does that break down based on gender or age. And then you could do the same sort of thing. Yeah, my bike helmet's getting soaked. Um. <laughs> Great. Um, we're in the same boat. Uh, exactly. So, um, yeah. So then you, then you could fix up the survey results in a similar fashion. Um, but, you know, it's kind of shocking that 50% of survey respondents were under 15. Ha Crystal was pretty confused by this, too. Um, you know, so maybe it's actually that there's a huge bias where young people are more willing to answer surveys. Similarly, uh, a question I had for her, which wasn't addressed in a talk I saw by her at Wikimania a year ago, was the question of which of these fields were mandatory. And uh, perhaps people who are new editors are more likely to fill out the survey because they just like, love being involved in the community and are really trying to get a foothold. Uh, or maybe it's the opposite, and maybe this is all worse than she got back. Uh, and the reason to know is so that when you make a change, like at changing the way the interface works or sending more personalized messages to people, you can answer the question of, of you know, is our children learning? Are the, <laughs> are the contributors becoming more active, which is what you wanted in the first place? I did talk to her after that, and I got some answers to these questions. So of the people who filled out the survey, these are the missing groups. Uh, Gender was a required field, but 20-ish percent of respondents just didn't answer about their age. Um, and uh, we don't know if maybe seeing gender caused people to just close the survey. Uh, and we don't know which editing levels were more and less likely to answer. Um, you could get a sense of this one by having her, oh, uh, this one you can figure out from the data she has because she has all the usernames and she can generate those graphs for all the people who didn't answer um, and like add some cute error bars to those graphs. Uh, so that's WikiHow. Um, that's one place. It's a slightly freely licensed encyclopedia. It's not really an open source software project. Um, there's one topic that the Go survey tried to touch on is why do they bother? Why do people contribute to open source? Uh, so there's this lovely graph made by the Thunderbird team through an opt-in survey. And according to Thunderbird, if you can see this, the plurality reason to contribute to Thunderbird is to have my efforts help millions of people. But it's pretty different from the ghost's answer of people join my project probably to learn new things. Uh, so if you're the Thunderbird team, this suggests that you should put this front and center on your new contributor documentation. You're helping millions of people, and you shouldn't necessarily spend all that much energy on uh, learning new skills, because if anywhere, that shows up somewhere out here. Uh, alternatively, you could believe that the people who just want to show up and learn new skills try to contribute to Thunderbird, fall off this massive, steep on-ramp, uh, veer off to the side, and don't get around to filling out the survey. Uh, but at least what I hope you'll see is that different communities have, the people in different communities have different rationales for participating. So knowing the broad sense of it from the academics won't necessarily help you. Uh, 
And in fact, you don't even really know what will cause people to change to do more work unless you run some experiments. So a mouse, a mouse. So uh, these have all been about surveys where people fill in information into forms. They try to tell you who they are and what they can do with a little bit of backing work to learn more about the respondents to the survey. But if we, what we want to know is how do we make our communities more active, maybe we should try running some experiments and see if we cause more activity. So I think that the GNOME Women's Outreach Project, in a way, is the first free software behavioral study that I know. In 2005, the GNOME Foundation received, uh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, in 2006, initially, they had received of 181 applicants uh, for Google Summer of Code. Can anyone guess what percentage of these were men? Ninety-something. Actually, it's 100. Plain old 100, literally zero. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it sounds really bad, um, but it's really just a matter of sample bias. You can consider the sign-in, the, the form to apply to Google Summer of Code, kind of like these opt-in surveys, where the information gets spread through random channels, uh, there's some process by which people learn about the program at all. And if you do something like start the same, the very same event with the same structure of paying students to work on code in GNOME with the process of it being mentored by a module owner over the course of the summer, uh, you can have very different results. You can have 100 new applicants to your not Google Summer of Code, but Women's, software, women's Summer Outreach Program. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like blown away by this because what a great job Hannah and Chris did of running a behavioral study where they altered the text around the very same activity and totally blew the old results out of the water. And yeah, it's the very same model of Google Summer of Code. Summer funding was up to the same amount. They got their money from companies that wanted to support GNOME, uh, not Google in that case at the time, but uh, Google has supported more recent versions of this program. Um, if you had just surveyed the 121 people who applied, I mean, obviously you would find zero women, and things that you would know about how they found out about that particular Google Summer of Code wouldn't apply to the other people you want to include in the first place. So um, one, there are some things we don't yet know about, oh yeah, uh, there are some things we don't yet know about the Women's Summer Outreach Program. So. We don't know if these community members stick around more or less in the community. There's a bit of work going on by Kevin Carrillo to survey newcomers in open source communities and find out uh, what makes their experience more and less good and do some other work behind the scenes to find out if they stick around. But his survey was an opt-in survey, so we'll have some limited insight from it. Uh, but still, we can begin to ask these questions and Maybe by knowing the answers to this, we can break them down and say, oh, actually, there's this particular university, there's these particular universities in Romania and in Arkansas where contributors have a huge retention rate. Uh, and then we discover maybe that all those people went to open source classes in their universities, and then that's the answer of how to get more women applying to the summer outreach program who stick around. Uh, I can imagine a hypothetical behavioral study. Thanks. Uh, so this is sort of how behavioral studies are supposed to work, where if you have this enormous population, you don't need all that many of them. 200 is actually already plenty. 50 is probably already plenty. So long as you sample them randomly, uh, you find out who they are, preferably, bef uh, well, you find out who they are after you've randomly sampled, and then you can make statements about how the gender breakdown and the demographic breakdown occurs in that community as a whole, because you know you didn't introduce new bias when you selected them. Uh, and if you wanted to uh, do this on GitHub, for example, then you might have a, tr a, a sense of how active and inactive, how present and not present various demographic groups are in the free software community. So I think that this, rather than the opt-in survey, would be the tool to use to find out the current state, and maybe to do it again every other year to track the progress up or down, uh, hopefully up. So, yeah, if we want to find out the real demographics, I think this is the way to do it, and opt-in surveys just aren't going to work. I want to tell you now about a couple of things that I've been involved in 
Uh, I'll gloss over this one a little bit because I talked about it a bit earlier today. Uh, I talk about it almost everywhere I go, I guess. But at, uh, in 2010, I ran the first open source comes to campus event to help teach undergrads, in this case at the University of Pennsylvania, how to get involved in free software. And we didn't do any particular gender diversity seeking outreach. We just wrote a really friendly email to all computer science students. And we got 30% of our applicants as women based on looking at their names and guessing. And uh, I think that a lot of that has to do with kind of a more subtle version of what Hannah and Chris found, which is that the way you phrase things, even if you don't necessarily say women at all, makes a big difference in your response rates. Uh, not in these figures is the fact that the majority of our applicants and then attendees were freshmen and sophomores in college. So maybe only freshmen and sophomores are interested in learning new things. I wouldn't put it past that. Uh, but a thing we don't know is if we had an impact on the students who came. Uh, I actually chatted with, some of them, with one of them recently by email, catching up about something else, and she said, oh, I remember so fondly that event. And that's good, but you know, I'd like to know something like, I'd like to be able to answer the question, how many thousand open source comes to campus events need to get run every year to fix the gender gap in free software? Because then we would just run that many, and then we'd be done. Super easy, right? But uh, we don't know if we have, we're not tracking yet if these contributors are sticking around in free software communities. So I think the best way to do that is to take GitHub profile IDs from the people who show up to the events and people who didn't show up to the events and track them over time. And then you can say something like, well, people who come to open source comes to campus events that are run with a women in computing group seem to be 35% more likely to be this much more active on GitHub. Uh, and then you can also very clearly say that you're impacting those women in CS groups as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a topic I often talk about. I'll breeze through it here, but basically, Railsbridge San Francisco once saw this graph, 2% women, 98% men. And uh, they saw the graph, which is to say Sarah May and Sarah Allen looked around the room and found only each other. And they decided to run a bunch of, they decided to stage an intervention. The intervention was, let's run introductory programming workshops for women and their friends called RailsBridge. And within a year, they moved, that, they moved the user group forward by sampling at the events uh, to 18%, which is a super great result. And so it seemed like the kind of thing that I wanted to clone to see if I could reproduce the wor work I could. Uh, and there's been a whole bunch of spin-off events. Um, we're doing this new thing at OpenHatch called OpenHatch Affiliated Events, where anyone who's running a uh, gender diversity or general newcomer friendliness event, we'd love it if you would go to a wiki page uh, called OpenHatch Affiliated Events and read all the text there about all the great ways that you all can help each other and we can help you and run more events like these, because I think that outreach events based on those figures are worth spending time on. Um, there are some limitations, though. It seems to only work in big cities. It seems to only work if you can convince an existing user group that your plan is worth doing. On the bright side, we have these graphs. So maybe that helps them to get convinced. So uh, there's some changes we're working on with Open Source Comes to Campus. I'll skip over that because there's a couple things I wanted to focus on. Uh, one is that, this is the answer to the question, what do undergrad students seem to know when they show up to Open Source Comes to Campus? Are they already good experts? Uh, who signs up for these things? Uh, what is the impact on changing gender from a male-female option box to just a plain text field? And I was sort of on the wrong side of history a year and a half ago or so. I was saying on the events mailing list that I kind of really liked this male-female mandatory radio button because then we could be sure that people had to fill it out and then we wouldn't have trouble uh, analyzing the results. But then it turns out that if you make it into text field, everyone replies. Great. Uh, and the results, so far we've had no complicated results to it. And if we do, then we just know that that's the case. And we haven't made anyone unsafe. I have a mailing list thread in which I eat my hat. Does that count? Yes. OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it turns out that many students show up excited to learn Git. And most of the students, at least at our events, don't know about it. Now, maybe we have some sample bias, because if they already knew it, maybe they wouldn't sign up for this teaching event. Um, in the five-ish minutes I have left, OK. Uh, I want to touch on a few very active angles for actively uh, attempting to modify free software communities. So um, two years ago, 
Dave Neary and Don Foster had worked on a project with Migo, as part of Migo to track new contributors and contributors on the whole. They ended up with a massive dashboard that you can read about here. It's an enormous ball of code. Uh, um, and as far as I know, no other projects have gotten around replicating it, but it gives you this cool looking dashboard from which you can do, you can ask the beginnings of questions. Mostly I mentioned it for completeness. Uh, in 20 seconds, I'll tell you that niceness matters when you communicate with users on a website like Wikipedia. If you are, uh, if you consider changing the tone of a message that gets sent to users when they vandalize a page, fewer, uh, the people who vandalized it by accident will become, more of them will become positive contributors to your system rather than vanishing like they used to. Uh, and similarly, if you use the active voice, they're more likely to take you seriously. <laughs> Which is amazing. Um, Wikipedia did an A-B test on the automated messages that get sent to vandals. Um, but whatever. There's some details that I'm not going to cover right now. The MediaWiki project uh, for September, October, November, and December has been trying to get more of a sense of its community using something like the Amigo dashboard. And I have some links in the slides to the tools they're using. Um, they haven't actually been updating that, though. Uh, I think, you tell me, Andre, I think because it's not actionable. The results you get from these are just like, this mailing list is more active, but it doesn't tell you how to make a mailing list more active. Can you repeat it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my theory for why you guys haven't been updating the, the community metrics pages as frequently is that it doesn't give you information that you can act on. Um, I think that Kim, who's responsible for this, is working on it, and next month things should be better again. I don't know exactly okay. what the issues are right now. Okay. Uh, well, I'll rush over a couple of things and emphasize two. One is the Ubuntu Developer Advisory Team. So. Uh, there's this wiki page that contains all the following text. Hey, guys, we're going to uh, be really nice to our contributors, and we have these three goals. Oh, sorry. We have these three goals that add up to being nice to people. And when I see wiki pages like this in an pro open source project, it reminds me of blog posts that say, I'm going to start blogging again, guys. Blogging was so much fun. <laughs> and it's the last post on the blog, and that was in 2009. Uh, and it turns out that the, the developer advisory team is doing more than nothing. They are. Uh, doing an open-ended question set where they send them to new contributors. They've learned a few things from that. They do that once per six months. Has some opt-in bias, but people seem to like contributing to Ubuntu, which is pretty cool. But what they really get excited, what they do that really excites me, is every time a new contributor shows up to uh, the community, they create a Trello card, and they have these columns. Um, there's a card with the person's name on it, and the first column is, just showed up, did their first upload. The next column is, experienced contributor. The next column is, we should tell them to apply for developer status. And the final column is, we ask them to apply and they're in the queue. And this sort of mentorship team goes and marks people as owned by them, uh, sends them a form email, but it's fairly personalized. says, hey, thanks for doing something. How can we make your life better? Um, so every Ubuntu contributor gets sent a personalized greeting and thank you. Uh, because they're using automated tools to find out who these new contributors are. They don't miss people. Um, and I won't demo it. You'll have to be satisfied with my hand wavy version. But the one question you might ask from all of this is, it sounds super friendly, but is it going to increase outcomes? Uh, and Ubuntu doesn't know that, because they just did it for everyone. Uh, I think you're about to tell me I have like 30 seconds left. Um, so people often lie to themselves and believe that free software it's so hard to get metrics. How are we going to count how many people use Debian? There's mirrored all over the place. Uh, we can't track where people click in Diaspora because we're sensitive to people's privacy. Uh, the big ones fall through is hard for volunteers, which relates to a story that I failed on that's in these slides. Um, what I will say is that there are a lot of metrics. Uh, and this summer, we have a Google Summer of Code student who is cloning the developer advisory team tooling, first to translate it from Ubuntu to Debian, which is a very similar community, then to create, make it more scientific by opting some people out of us contacting them. If we're, in a way, if we're lucky, what we'll find is that contacting new contributors is just a waste of time. It doesn't improve outcomes, and we should do something else. And if we learn that, then we can go off and find what that something else is. And then once we're done with that, if once Dave Lou is done with that, we'll make it generic and offer import for other data sources for other projects so that 
you all can make amazing automatic contributor tracking dashboards that uh, make your skin crawl a tiny bit, but bring results. <laughs> so uh, I'll skip over the meta organizing. Um, I have plenty more to talk about on this topic. Um, I'll mention that I'm very interested in helping Google Summer of Code mentorship get better. And I want to run a study there, but I seem to be running out of time, not just here, but in my life. So if you want to help me do that, I can totally use it. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are some other resources in the slides, but the big thing I want to say is that you should do something. You should find some aspect of your community you want to measure and work with me or other people to measure it. There's a great community at list.opentash.org slash events, which includes social scientists, statisticians, and free software advocates who will help you run those studies. And if you're a company that thinks this stuff is pretty cool, then you should totally help us, help fund us so that we can run these events and run these surveys so we can help answer the questions of how to make free software communities better with science. Thanks. Thanks.